Yes. So um, thank you very much. Um, developing a language plugin for an IDE these days is a very major programming effort. It takes multiple developers to develop these plugins, multiple years. And to illustrate this effort, look at the sizes of code bases of uh, Scala plugins for multiple IDEs. As you can see here, the IntelliJ plugin for Scala consists of approximately a quarter million lines of code. They even added their own incremental compiler to get special static analysis. The problem with this is that the problem, the microphone went off. I just continue. This one? So the problem with this is that um, none of these language plugins share any code. So a lot of this effort for these different language plugins is actually redundant. Even worse is that language plugins for multiple IDEs, they differ in, in features. So for example, the uh, IntelliJ plugin for uh, JavaScript, it has excellent support for code completion. It uses type, uh, type information to, to provide this code completion, whereas the uh, Eclipse plugin for JavaScript does not contain this information. So does this mean that Eclipse developers are simply out of luck and cannot be as productive as uh, developers that use uh, um, IntelliJ? So the root cause of this is that, um, that the plugin mechanisms for different IDEs are uh, completely different. So they actually cannot share any code. So in our paper, we identified this problem as the IDE portability problem. And it's depicted with this diagram, with IDEs on the left and languages on the right. And to, to give an example, the problem is that, for example, Haskell developers now have to focus on multiple language plugins for multiple IDEs. They have to develop a Haskell plugin for Eclipse, a Haskell plugin for IntelliJ, and a Haskell plugin for Emacs. The Haskell plugin for Eclipse, for example, is implemented in Java. Uh, it's, it's very unnatural to, to implement this in Java because most of the tooling for Haskell is obviously available in Haskell and not in Java. <coughs> so they have to re-implement a lot of this functionality. Another problem is that <coughs> um, IntelliJ developers, they have to focus on multiple languages. So um, this makes it actually harder for them to change their uh, plugin interface. So they cannot move uh, as quickly to add new features to the IDE. And none of the plugins for the other IDEs um, share any code. So this is the overall view of the, the problem. In this case, we have nine implementations for each language and each IDE. So um, we propose a solution to this problem, namely Monto. So with, with Monto, the situation looks like this. We only need to implement one single language plugin, uh, one single IDE plugin to give support for all languages. And each language only needs to implement what uh, we call it one language service to cater all IDEs. So overall, the situation looks like this. Um, the, the number of uh, required implementation is now six. Three language, uh, three IDE plugins, and three language services. 
So we reduced uh, a lot of redundant effort here. So what is Monto? To give proper credit, Monto was uh, introduced originally by Tony uh, in SLE 14, and it was a way to uh, make uh, IDE development easy easier. It was a way to make IDE uh, development easier uh, and to um, extract components out of IDEs. So what we did, we took the uh, general idea of Monto and uh, provided a solution to the I IDE portability problem I just explained. So how do we do this? Um, we do this by introducing a universal plugin interface, so an IDE and language independent intermediate representation to uh, represent service uh, editor service results. Furthermore, we define a service oriented architecture uh, that decouples IDEs from services. And lastly, we conducted a case study where we implemented two Monto plugins for two IDEs and uh, four language services, and I will come to this later. So let's post first focus on the IDE and le uh, of the about the uh, intermediate representation. So how does one design such an intermediate representation? Um, so what we are aiming for is to reuse the same intermediate representation for multiple languages and multiple IDEs. So the intermediate representation, in a sense, has to be expressive enough to express the results of um, multiple languages, and it has to be restricted enough such that the results can be used in multiple IDEs in a meaningful way. So we are kind of looking for a greatest common divisor these good metrics. So what we have developed so far is intermediate representation for a baseline of uh, IDE support. So we developed intermediate representation for syntax highlighting, outline views, error reporting, and service configuration. To give you an example how this intermediate representation looks like, here is uh, the, the intermediate representation for syntax highlighting. Um, intermediate representation on the left and the syntax highlighting result on the right. So as you can see, we used JSON to uh, for our intermediate representation to lower the effort to write custom parsers for the intermediate representation. As you can see here, uh, to highlight a piece of source code, it's a list of syntactic region. Each region is uh, marked using a character offset in the document at a length, and we include some style information. <laughs> so, and we added some style information um, that is derived from CSS because it also works well in the browser. Um, another example is here for our uh, intermediate representation for outline views. So um, an outline view basically has this nested structure and we account for this by letting each item of the outline view uh, have some, some children. And again, each uh, outline item is marked by a region such that when the user clicks one of these outline items, the IDE can jump to the position in the source code where uh, that is associated with each outline item. And furthermore, it contains a label that is displayed, it's the text that's displayed in each item, and an icon that can be displayed as well. This is the example of the intermediate representation for service configuration. So service configuration can, for example, be used to adjust the syntax highlighting for a service, um, and note here that the intermediate representation is uh, independent from each service. So we support a variety of configuration options like number options, checkboxes, and so on, which we also derive from HTML forms. 
Okay, so let's now look at the service-oriented architecture that Monto defines. So our service-oriented architecture has three goals. These goals are that we want to enable to easily add new language services for new languages. This makes sense because IDEs already have this fun uh, functionality. We can easily add new languages. Furthermore, we want to be able to split up the services for one language into multiple smaller language services that solve uh, a particular problem and that can depend on the results of other language services. Why do we do this? Well, we want to be able to switch out certain parts of the service and replace it by other services, for example, or we want to be able to add new services at runtime. The third goal is that uh, we want to be able um, to implement these services in any implementation language. So why is this important? For example, it makes it much easier to write a wrapper around the Haskell uh, compiler GHC to provide their uh, results to, to Monto. The, the Haskell compiler is written in, GHC, uh, in, 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 uh, in Haskell and it has an Haskell API, so the wrapper should also be written in Haskell. So this is an overview of the architecture of Monto. It has kind of three tiers. So the, the one tier is here the IDE with the Monto language plugin. And on the right hand side, we have uh, the, the services <coughs> that run independently. And in the middle, we have a broker that uh, we use to decouple IDEs from language services. So th this broker is kind of a mediator that uh, IDEs and language services have do not have directly uh, do not need to communicate directly with each other. So, how does an, an workflow in this architecture look like? So the uh, idea is that the user changes a source document in the IDE, and um, the Monto plugin then packages the contents of the source file and sends a message to the broker. The broker then looks up in its dependency graph of services which service depends on the source message uh, only. In this case, the Java parser depends on uh, the source message. And the broker sends this message to the parser. And it keeps a copy for, uh, of the uh, source message for later use. The parser then parses the source document and produces uh, an AST, and also we have defined an intermediate representation for an AST, and sends it back to the broker. The broker then again looks up in its dependency graph which services depend on the uh, AST and the source message. In this case, the Java type checker and the Java output liner both depend on these uh, messages, so the broker forwards these messages to these services. The services then can start in parallel and processing these uh, messages and re uh, turning them into the respective intermediate representation. The services then send their, their results back to the broker and um, the broker then forwards these messages to the IDE. The problem then is that um, this, these messages cannot be displayed to the user, right? It's just the intermediate representation. So the responsibility now is of the Monto plugin to interpret these, uh, this intermediate representation, call the IDE-specific uh, API, and update the view. And the user can observe the results. So to summarize, uh, in this architecture, services can depend on the results of other services. Um, all state in this architecture is maintained by the broker, so the broker is kind of the source of, the source of truth in the system. And services can be implemented stateless, meaning that they take all the input at once and produce their output. So the, the implementation of services is actually very easy. And uh, to, to show you how these services are implemented, this is a Java code example of the Java outline service. 
and you have to basically implement one method that uh, is the met method that is called whenever a service receives a, a a result. So what you have to do is you have to unpack the uh, messages that you need. You have to um, produce the, the outline result and you package it up in the uh, appropriate intermediate representation and send it back to the broker. So there's, uh, it is actually very simple to implement these services. This is an example of uh, the Haskell service that we wrote. And here, again, it's quite simple. We call in here into the Haskell uh, GHC API. They, uh, G GHC API produces the results that we need. So the, it produces syntax highlighting, uh, outline, uh, outline views, and uh, errors. And we then package up these products and send it back to the uh, broker and uh, yes. So um, we conducted the case study to validate the usability of our intermediate representation and the uh, service-oriented architecture. And uh, we implemented a Monto plugin for Eclipse. And we have no doubt that the results of uh, this, this case study will um, work in other Java-based IDEs as well. And as a second choice for an IDE, we chose an uh, IDE that we based on CodeMirror. CodeMirror is uh, an editor that uh, works in the browser. So the architecture of this one is very different from Java-based IDEs. And um, we chose it to kind of restrict this design of the intermediate representation to work for these two very different IDEs. Furthermore, we uh, develop language services for four different <coughs> programming languages. And we also selected programming languages that are very different in nature. So we chose an object-oriented, statically typed language, a uh, dynamically typed object-oriented language, a prototype-based dynamically typed language, and a statically typed functional language. And we could, uh, we validated that all of these language services could uh, could use this intermediate representation that we defined, and that all IDEs could represent the results using this intermediate representation. So to conclude, we presented Monto as a solution to the I IDE portability problem. We um, developed intermediate representation for a baseline of uh, IDE support. And we presented a service-oriented architecture. A service-oriented architecture um, for uh, for Monto. Yes, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>